Very good afternoon. Welcome to very special health cafe for Kajian Pembangunan. Uh, many of you probably have attended health cafe series before. Health cafe is a seminar series that was uh, initially started by Pa Budir Sosdarman from NNU uh, four or five years ago, uh, I think. And it keeps running every month. And uh, the whole sector, so we have about 14, 15 institutions in Jakarta uh, who are involved, and also in other cities who are involved as a host of this series. And we are very glad that today we have a special cafe in the sense there is a lot of presentations. You can see in the uh, screen we have six, uh, seven presentations. And this will uh, go until 5.30. But because of time constraints, we are just going to have the presentation and Q&A uh, directly, don't break. But don't worry, there is a free flow of coffee and tea in the back, so feel free to uh, get coffee, tea, or water whenever you want uh, as we go along. Uh, my name is Arjen Patundru, I'm with the uh, Australian National University. I'm very glad to be in my former home, LPM. So thank you, uh, Tegu and friends at LPM for hosting this event. We also thank uh, Australian National University's Indonesia Project. Pak Budi is the head of the Indonesia, uh, uh, Indonesia Project at NU. And of course, special thanks to Richard Barcello of the University of British Columbia, who lead this uh, project, this book project. So, uh, to save some time, uh, I will ask Rick uh, to tell us what this is about, this pro project is about actually. So, uh, Rick. Thank you, Rianto. First of all, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today, and uh, I would like to give you a quick overview of the project so you can see uh, how the papers fit together. This is a book that is being published, and so each of the papers that you see here today is one chapter in that book. So uh, the title of the book that you see is Trade, Poverty, and Income Distribution, the, in the Indonesian Experience. Uh, Everybody here will be familiar with how um, the, um, the, the issue of globalization is and um, how it has uh, proceeded uh, rather rapidly across the world and for some decades now. One element of this is trade, and, and, um, and many countries, as you, as you well know, have policies that are uh, focused on trade. Um, um, but there are many uncertainties that this has generated, concerns, and, uh, and people, a number of people, are very worried that expanded or, or quickened globalization is uh, causing a negative effect on uh, a number of issues, but particularly on some dimensions of human rights. Um, this, uh, many others argue that this is quite clearly revealed in the decision of uh, the UK to um, exit from the EU, and um, others also argue that it's um, uh, part of why Trump was recently elected in the US. Um, I'd like to think that we were ahead of the curve on this, because we started exploring these issues um, some four or five years ago, and that's the origins, and it just turns out that, that it's very timely. So each of the, the country studies in this larger project is focused on a particular human right. Um, so to see what this particular uh, book or a component to the larger project is um, on how trade and, and particularly expanded trade, how will that affect two elements of human rights, poverty and income inequality. <coughs> Other books in the series are on other human rights and they tend to be focused on other countries, mostly in Asia. Um, the concern people express, um, 
follow by what I said a few minutes ago is that increased trade um, has mostly a negative effect on poverty and inequality. And that um, it looks like on the surface to some people that trade is increasing poverty and increasing inequality. Um, and uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, it's leading many people in various countries to want to shift policies uh, rather recently in the direction of reducing uh, trade. <coughs> now, um, in our work, in our in, in, in these series of papers, we um, focus on Indonesia, as I said, but we um, emphasize empirical studies. Um, so all of these chapters have data and results, not just theories. And there are nine chapters. Um, so one is a review chapter and an overview. Um, it draws on the literature on poverty and income inequality, uh, not just focusing on Indonesia, but um, another seven are empirical studies, and all of them have respected this respected Indonesian authors or co-authors, um, as you can see from around the room, and Indonesian data. One paper is more focused on institutional um, dimensions, on Indonesian laws and regulations concerning land rights. So if you think of institutional information data, it too has data, but not uh, in quite the same numerical way. And um, as you can see, it's timely and we hope you find it interesting. So this, uh, I know this is maybe a little bit too much detail to see, but this is a list of all the papers, and we'll go through them one by one, and then what I'll do um, in a minute, um, we can go on to the next. I, I've got here some, um, a little bit more detail, but I think we don't have time to go through this all at this point, and I'll let you read this uh, at your own time uh, a bit later. Uh, so, um, um, one thing I didn't mention earlier that I should add is almost all the papers I think have substantial attention to policy implications and options, um, even if those policies have not become part of the empirical work um, of the paper. Now, let me just uh, uh, mention one thing about how you can use the results of these papers. You might want to ask, can we draw conclusions from all these results for other countries? Are there lessons to do that? Or is it perhaps true that the Indonesian experience is quite unique? And I, I can't give you a full answer to that, but I've tried to summarize a number of points here that, uh, that go over that. And I think Indonesia is somewhat unique, um, but uh, I've tried to list a number of issues here the, the performance of Indonesia in terms of its economic growth has been good. Uh, the, the poverty levels have been growing impressively. Inequality started low, um, and, um, and, and then it has risen. Um, but this is something that's happened in virtually all countries. I would say that Indonesia has had perhaps more of a policy concern with inequality than other countries. And at least um, going back 40 years, if not longer, I, I only, my experience working here were only about 35 years ago, but even at that time, um, they, uh, it was a clear objective of the government um, to share the fruits of economic development widely. Um, I'm not saying it was always uh, implemented that way, but it has been an objective and a focus of intention. So, um, so I'll let you, um, you draw your own conclusion about how well that applies to other countries. Let me just um, mention um, the findings, the key findings of the two papers that are not being presented here today. Um, this is the opening paper, and it looks at empirical evidence of whether economic growth can be expected to increase or decrease inequality, and then which policy options exist to deal with it. Um, and they, they um, uh, document quite broad empirical evidence across a number of countries to show how income inequality has increased over the last 30 years. But the evidence that they present um, shows some 
contradiction of the widespread view that the trade-off, that there's a trade-off between growth and inequality that's inevitable. In other words, we uh, are able to show that uh, there are ways in which growth and inequality need not be um, uh, in moving in opposite directions. Um, and then, uh, finally, the uh, paper from Michael Lee uh, compares, uh, he looks at a property rights for land and looks at the traditional property rights uh, uh, where, where people, especially migrants, uh, have this generalized notion of a right to move to a city. Uh, that is to say that that right would mean that they have some security from forced evictions. But if you look at the way a lot of property rights have developed, particularly in the larger cities, uh, with um, those cities being linked quite closely to the practices and institutions of trade and development, you'll see that there's much more focus on private or individualized property rights. And you can see how that could often be in, in conflict with the that or collective rights to the city. And so uh, Michael explores that in, in a very uh, interesting way and that shows what the local resistance that I'm sure most of you here are familiar with, the resistance to the greater application of those uh, that property rights what implications that has for migration, particularly for rural areas to the cities and the income growth that causes. So um, that gives you uh, a feeling for the two papers that we don't have with us today. And uh, just as some general conclusions, I think yeah. I can say that we find that increased trade in Indonesia across our papers has tended to increase overall incomes and reduce poverty. Um, the effect on income inequality is not completely clear cut, but it has tended to be more negative um, with increased inequality associated with more trade openness. Uh, but but uh, if you look at the detail of the papers, you'll find that there, uh, there are variations in these results given in a number of specific situations. Uh, so I would say that these findings are very roughly consistent with what you will find in the broader economic development literature, but what makes these studies unique, I think, is that they're undertaken with more attention to local and regional data and variables than one normally sees in the literature where uh, the, the data that are used are, are quite aggregate and people don't have such a good knowledge of the country and its institutions. Um, in um, so I'll close for now and turn it over to Mary Thank you very much, uh, Abhi. So, um, that's the summary of the project, and let's just move uh, directly to the first paper in uh, Portuguese FKP, and that is the uh, right to side, as in high side. And uh, this paper is written by uh, Aris Ananta and Ibu Eliarity, both are affiliated with Universitas Malaysia and MS. So, I give the floor to you, but first. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we are happy that we are invited to be here. Terima kasih Pak Rey. Terima kasih Pak Hancho. In the leaflet, the title is the right to side. But we changed it. Because as Pak Rey mentioned, we started the project <coughs> years ago, so during the time we made some revision to adjust the team and we changed uh, the framework. So we made it disability as capability deprivation. A case study of visual disability in Indonesia. Do you take ability to see a human right? Or we take the rest? Next, uh, capability deprivation. Why I we take this concept? Uh, I 
really like the concept of Amartya Sen talking capability depreciation, which covering issues more than poverty. When we have poor people, when we are poor, sometimes when we get the money, uh, we can be richer, we can do business and so on. But if we are capability deprived, no matter how much money put in, we will still be poor. So that's why we concentrate on capability deprivation rather than only poverty. Matya Sen talking about poverty, yes, but he also talk about physical and mental disability. And one of the disability is the visual disabilities and environment. Visual ability to see. And I will explain later why we choose this topic. Next. This is two concepts are really like human capital, uh, pioneered by Gary Baker in the 1960s, 70, and Amartya yeah, Sen since 1970, but then in 2009 with the book The Ideal of Justice. Uh, I never met the two person, but I feel I'm a student of them. They may not like me. And my interpretation, similarity between the two, Terry Baker and Amartya Sen, is that they are seeing from the supply side of the individual something inherent in the individual. The, neo, the classical economics see from the supply side of the economy. The pension economics see from the aggregate demand. But Gary Baker and Amartya Sen see from the supply side of the individual. Gary Baker in particular see from education and health. But the difference is that actually they are the same, but the concern is different. Gary Baker concerned more with labor productivity. You, you should be healthy because by being healthy, you will be more productive, you produce more income. You should be educated because by being educated you will be more productive. Amartya Sen is seeing wider than web and they are talking about poverty. The concern is more about poverty, about uh, justice and justice and also disability. So actually the framework of Gary Baker can apply to the Amartya Sen but because the focus is different. They are almost the same. Next one. So what is the objective of the paper? The objective is to provide more understanding on the condition to create simple and cheap policies to reduce capability deprivation as a broader issue than poverty. So we broaden the issue rather than poverty that is to capability deprivation and we like to try to understand the condition in Indonesia. Is it possible to find a cheap policy? In economics, we talk about efficient, cheap, cheap policy which can reduce capability deprivation. But capability deprivation, there are so many issues in capability deprivation, we choose visual disability because Interestingly, visual disability can be prevented a lot and it's cheaper. So that if we could reduce uh, visual disability, then capability deprivation will be reduced a lot. I imagine that one day nobody is wearing eyeglasses, nobody is wearing contact lens to be like that kind of world that we do it. But maybe the business is not happy. It will be very good. And it used the information from the 2010 population census. This is the first census in Indonesia which collected data on disabilities, including visual disabilities. And this paper is the first who used the data to calculate the statistics. So our purpose is to show this is the condition in Indonesia and visual disability. What is the use of the paper for the business? <coughs> for 
for the business, for the market, they could use the data to create product, to create service, how to reduce uh, visual disability, including improvement the eyeglasses and contact lens and cataract surgery and on and so on. For the human rights side, is that because the business will not do everything, then the human right issue emerges. Human right emerges when there is a threat to the dignity. In one of the paper mentioned that if you do something and there is, you can do it freely, so no issue of human right. But when people cannot see clearly and there is no facility, then it become a threat to the dignity. So, this is the human right issue, including the policies to provide facility for those who cannot see well, facilities to have surgery and so on. And we imagine that even from the human rights side, as I said earlier, eradication, prevention of visual disability, including uh, vision with the eye. Next. The project, as Patrick mentioned before, initially using a DIAD framework that is here to approach this for seeing one issue. I am learning a lot this one. I am struggling to understand this and I hope now I could say it correctly, Patrick, if I am wrong. And the two issues is that we choose markets and human rights. Patrick said globalization. I said choose market versus human right. In market, visual disability, for example, the market responds because people are unable to see, they create many things, eyeglass, contact lens, and so on. Market responds so that reduce the capability deprivation. And market talk about efficiency. And human right responding to the threat suffering to human dignity. If people cannot see, they don't have the money to buy the products, then it becomes the issue of human rights and it's talking about justice. So this is the deal between market and human rights. Next. Next. Market versus human rights. Go more. From the market, we talk about the business, human right, we talk about the right to side, right to side. And then we talk about the visual disability in Indonesia. And this becoming more important because we are looking to the digitized world. Everything we need to reduce our uh, sight. We are talking about prevention like lifestyle. Uh, Nowadays, we have a very bad lifestyle. Every time we don't have anything to do, we are doing like this. We are happy. Even when it is very dark, dark, and then it reduces the ability to see. The business is happy, but from the capability deprivation perspective, it is very bad. Next. Why visual disability? Because it's becoming more important in today's digital world and visual disabilities are avoidable, including what we eat, what we consume, relative to other disabilities. <coughs> Technologies to avoid visual disabilities are relatively cheap, simple, and having high probability of success. Cataract treatment relatively easy and probability of success is very high. Eyeglass is cheaper and simple compared to hearing aid, for example. Five priorities of fashion 2020, this is by the UN, is to avoid blindness, cataract, trachoma, onchocerciasis, childhood blindness, including vitamin A deficiency, is very simple, vitamin A deficiency and refractive error and your vision. Next. 
Yeah, this is on the wall about the global magnitude of blindness and impairment. Uh, 280 million people be, uh, visually impaired, 246 million people no vision, and 59 people blind. So there are still many cases of blindness. Next. The global main causes blindness, visual impairment, and all of them are avoidable. Cataract 51% and incorrected refractive errors. This is all avoidable. So can we all avoid that? So we can improve the welfare of the people. Next. Other causes. Okay, next. Global responses. This is what Google has done. They launched in 1999. They make a vision 220. The, 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 the agenda is the right to sign as a global initiative to eliminate avoidable blindness, jointly by the WHO and International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. The target is for two decades, between 100 million from becoming blind, so 2020, almost there. And it has been adopted by the World Health Assembly. Next. And then in 2007, Indonesia already signed the declaration for the right to sign. Next. is the Indonesian response. I think UAP will come to say how Indonesia responds and then go to the our finding about the condition in Indonesia in disability. From there, hopefully the business and the market and the human rights activists can use our data to respond how to eradicate uh, capability depreciation, particular in terms of visual disability. Wow, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think my uh, presentation and I think uh, the issue on the right to strike is very important. Just before my presentation, I would like to know, even in this room, is there anyone among you that you don't use any glasses or contact I just want to know. One person? Anyone else? Then it is one person from regulation. And then she was the only one who had the healthy eyes. The rest of us here, we have problems with our eyes. So that is why this greatest issue for us to talk about. I don't know how many people in this room, if it is only you. So congratulations, may you get your eyes. Don't follow me with this, this idea. This is for life, forever. Okay, everyone else? No. Okay, that's the only one here in this room. So then, this bring this thing to a very important issue to bring this as we live in a digital area. This is what is sung in this room, and what is the global picture of the visual impairment in Indonesia. That's what I'm going to present in my in, in, in this event. So can you please uh, change the of the object? Uh, Okay. Let me just move back to the earlier slide. Okay. Um. Okay. Let me just talk to you. I think the rest of this part too. Um. And then, okay. Earlier slide. Earlier slide again. Okay. Okay. 
First of all, before this, what happened? What the question of the Indonesian government? Then, as Paris mentioned earlier, 2006, we signed a convention and the person with disability, which is ICE, is one of the type of disabilities. Then, it took four years to finally our government ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is that on the 2011, October 2011. That the convention passed finally in November, and then um, what next uh, that our government has done, next slide please, that in terms of policy, in 2004 and 2013, Indonesian National Plan of Action on the person with disability, with their age agenda. Some have organization and association of the elderly with disability, while put the elderly here, we will see later in our data. Why we focus on that particular group of people in Indonesia. And then, women with disability, early warning and intervention, education, training, and work placement, access to surrounding and public transportation, access to information and communication. We need this information and communication, um, and also technology. And poverty and education, that the point that we will put this uh, team uh, under the poverty team, um, then international cooperation as we are dealing with um, a globalization and also trade here. Um, next slide. Um, then what the government uh, have done to us? First, thank you so much for the Bureau of Social Statistics, and I think we have a time, my friend, but three. Okay, thank you. My history from the text is here. Then our data based on that your institution have collected. And we started collecting the information, especially since 2006, using the Susanas. And in 2009, Susanas, then 2010, under population census, that for the first time. What the good thing is that in the census, the coverage is full of coverage. So this one, using the population census data, we have more um, complete information, which can lead to understanding on the visual disability or impairment at the district level. And this information is very important for business. Then home, the question is that here, why is it very important? How many people in Indonesia suffer from visual impairment? Next slide. Of course, there is some weakness here if you want to know more about visual impairment using census data is that the coverage is still too broad. We cannot really link to the poverty um, point, at least, but at least this one, using the public and census in terms of a coverage, is a small complete coverage. Then we can have estimate even under to the district level. Next slide. So that here. Is this one is the mug nature. If it's in this room, I don't know how many less than a hundred people in this room, but for Catholic in Indonesia, it's almost six million. It's almost six million in 2010 that the Indonesians have a problem with the vision. Which is, if we can break down into two, it will the one who have some problem and a severe problem in the outside. The good thing is that the severe is only 0 0.5 million, or it's about 8.7% of them suffering from the zero visual impact. So the next slide is that it's about 8%. So if you look at all, across the bottom line, that one is the age. We can compare which one is the picking up in terms of the number. Um, is uh, that one um, 35 and above. 
the number of Bishoka. Meaning that it's about 400, 400, no, 400,000 people having a problem with the heart. It's a big business if you want to see it from the business perspective because that's a huge potential for customers. Yeah? We're offering other technologies from outside the country coming to Indonesia. That's the point when the trade is coming here. So if you look at our people, this is a huge market. It's a potential market for selling high glasses, contactors, um, kind of operation of work that from the sector. Next slide. So if you look at and differentiate between the urban world, there's the problem here. Where are, the, where are the people in Indonesia? Which basically, this picture gives two different, two different patterns, which is in the urban area, the peak is much younger than in the rural area. So in the rural area, those who are suffering from the eye problem, it is much colder in the urban area. So immediately we are getting more urbanized, and our lifestyle is not as good as we do now, or we continue the same lifestyle in the future as we are going to the urban area, as more urbanization, then the one sour of high vision of the urban area, which is at the same time we consuming more digital information and things like that. So that's all for this. The next slide. So that is a of number. So now we want to see the rate and the distribution. Um, uh, next slide. If you see from the distribution of the visual impact on the next slide, um, here that for it. You can see in terms of the percentage that um, for some difficulties, if you see the, the, the blue line, the pattern is that if you see from that, that problem happened to the prime of the population, the workforce. The workforce is suffering from the visual impact compared to the more severe difficulty. It's more to the order of So this will affect the productivity in the of economic issues. Or we might consume more our consumption on the right glass or whatever things related to our the next one slides. It gives us so how this is be compared in Indonesia to the US. This is what we can see here. If we see some difficulty we are about in the case of number smaller than in the US. But if we can see the red line there, which more severe difficulty which can lead and um, more people probably learn, then we are much better, especially for the 79 and above. We are much smaller than the US. So, uh, yeah. so at least this problem, and see the numbers seem to be larger, but if we compare with the US, we still um, uh, low. So the next slide that we want to show the you, uh, present to you the next slide, please. Um, so this is the pattern. Let me see how the pattern um, across of urban and rural um, in terms of the different degree of um, uh, visual impact. We see different pictures. We see different pictures, which is red, the dark, um, the, the black, um, the black solid line. Is referring to the woman, which is much younger. The peak is much younger than the one you know, in a rural area. So that's the same uh, as before when we compare to the woman and the rural area. The next slide. So that is a of the distribution. But how about the preference? The preference here is different measurement. Preference is measuring if we are. Um, 25, say we are 25 until 50 years old, for any emotion suffering from um, visual impact. So next slide, I just have some more slides, and this is the pattern. The pattern takes a change state. 
What must you do with JC? As we are getting older, as we are getting older, the probability to suffer from the high problems is getting up. And every day we are getting older. So we pray. As we are getting older, the chance to help the high problem is getting worse. That is what the saints did. When is the escalation clear? You can see that one. As we reach above 35, that kind of probability is accelerating. So, if many of you here before uh, less than 35 years old, maintain a good period in preventing or maintaining your life. That prevents the world not so much different. Even a uh, woman and a uh, female and male, that's like uh, also my next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So, okay, I'll tell you that. Um, that's different preference. Um, a still a J shape, but different level in terms of the degree of difficulties. And talk about this one compared to what happened in Indonesia and the US. Um, so you can see that um, the red line is something because in the low region, um, that's higher, um, lower, so that um, for the more severe um, eye problem, this is much lower. So that we have, uh, if we want to eliminate uh, the problem in our patient, uh, then deal with those with some difficulty. That's a good news here, uh, in a way. Some difficulty is more dominating rather than the severe of our problem. So at least that treatable and preventable. So, I think that I can uh, present about the fact what happened in Indonesia. Um, and I think I'll be back uh, my first time with that and I'll stop up with um, for this presentation. And thank you so much for your attention. So now we know that when the population is getting aging, more people are suffering from visual disability. Urbanization is rising, more people having visual disability. So this is a good business opportunity. You could sell products and services for people who are having more and more visual disabilities. In the human rights side, those who don't have the money will suffer from visual disability. So that this can be issues on the human rights. But the next thing is that <coughs> it, it seems there is a contradiction between the market for business and human rights. But to us, both sides can work together. How the business create condition, lifestyle condition from the beginning of the life so that people can avoid visual disabilities and can avoid using even using eyeglass, contact lens and so on. So this fulfill the business opportunity and it also fulfill the human right. So there is a triple win solution. Good for the business, good for the people, good for the human right and good for the productivity of the mission. I hope this data can help to understand between the the market and human rights. I think thank you very much. Uh, I thought uh, let's take two or three questions from the floor. Anybody has questions? Or comment? Yeah, or would you? Uh, Paris, thank you for the presentation. Uh, from the from that, that the the work that you have done in this uh, issue, as you find an indication between uh, seeing disability and productivity. We 
the Tendang on that one in terms of labor productivity or the income and so on. Our concern is not on labor productivity. When we are talking about human capital, we talk more on labor productivity, but we talk about capability deprecation. It may not increase the ability to gain income. For example, an older person, 75 years old, probably of cataract. When we have cataract surgery, this person can see better. But maybe the productivity is not improving because 75 years old, he cannot do writing, he cannot do many things. But he is happier. He could see his family better, he could see his friends better and so on. And this increases the welfare of the society. Not necessarily labor productivity, but increases the welfare. And this is relatively cheap. The process of cataract surgery is relatively cheap. So we haven't done, it's very interesting to study about the impact of this on labor productivity. But our hypothesis is that it's not necessarily having positive impact on labor productivity, but our hypothesis is that it does improve the welfare of the people. Next question. Or comment? I have a question for Aris. Uh, you compare Indonesia with the United States, uh, with the US. How about uh, countries in the region? Putting together an issue of 
Please give another applause to our So let's now move to the second paper. Uh, that would be Martin Lopat, who's Sama Arikin of the University of Lampo. University of Lampo is going to talk about coffee eco certification, new challenges for farmers' welfare. Martin Thank you very much. Terima kasih, Pak Adalto Pantuku. Bapak Ustadzah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for this opportunity, Pak Rik. I appreciate it. Um, giving a chance to me to uh, contribute to the paper. The, the title is uh, really a uh, sub-globalization, if you want to call it. Okay? This is about international trade, but <coughs> In the international trade, I'm looking at the eco certification. Uh, actually, I have um, cases in agricultural products, but today I'm here yeah, focusing on coffee. Okay, uh, I put it new challenges on uh, farmers' welfare, whether uh, the main cases of the book um, globalization or actually trade contribute to the poverty. Um, but this is a really new challenge. Uh, only the, the main statement, if we or farmers cannot adapt the new uh, initiative of uh, eco certification, I think we cannot get the, the benefit of it. Okay? Um, okay, I have at least uh, one, um, at least three uh, case studies. Actually, I, I, I wrote two in the, um, in the book. But I put the third one, this is uh, just um, finished last year. Um, first, I'll explain about the, the coffee and um, about the energetics um, of uh, eco certification, actually sustainability standards. Um, then, uh, introductory um, previous studies um, um, three, three practices of eco certification in three major producing regions. Why I'm why um, uh, interested in exploring this? Uh, maybe I will skip this because um, the introduction is, is not well, maybe I'll uh, 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 explain to you. For those who are new, for some uh, really new in coffee, well, you think in coffee, but uh, <laughs> not thinking how the coffee is being produced by our farmer. Indonesia is number three or number four uh, as major producers after Colombia, Brazil, Colombia, and Vietnam. Sometimes we are number three, we are passed off of Colombia. Uh, but in Arabusta, we are number two after the Brazil. Okay? However, our yield, our productivity, is very small, only uh, 560. Sometimes uh, uh, in other places the average maximum is 600. Um, it's very far away when compared to Vietnam. Three pound per hectare, two and a half pound per hectare. Okay? It's very far away. Okay? Uh, so we cannot, we cannot compete with them. Um, the new growing, you uh, missed something I could say, no, the, 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 the new growing tendency is about Arabica. Uh, everyone is now growing Arabica, but Arabica requires a higher altitude. Um, at least 800, maybe more, uh, 1,000 uh, pounds. Okay? Um, not one, not, not, not only, uh, what is the difference? If you feel taste it a little bit sour and strong, well, sour, tasty, sweety, this is But strong, uh, black, and so this clump of coffee must be roast. <laughs> I, I tried to learn that. Right? It's not, it's not, it's not lamp. <laughs> okay. Uh, where did the coffee we produce here? I check, uh, mostly in here, um, these two contribute about 60% soft smell crime down. Well, uh, from 50 actually. Uh, because uh, some, uh, some regions are growing right now. Um, actually, I have an obsession to write uh, all the regions. I, I haven't visited Wamena, but I visit everybody. everybody, everybody. Wamena is a new growing uh, coffee field. Okay? Okay, uh, this is the uh, percentage. Um, 
Southern Sumatra and Bengkulu is about 50%, I would say earlier. People in Southern Southern Sumatra. Aceh 7.7, South Sumatra, Kopi, Mandailing, Batak, everything, Sibikalan is all here. Toraja, Kalosi is uh, in South Sumatra. Uh, but but when I put it here, there's the, the book, the theme of the book is coming here. These regions are the poorest of the country. Can you imagine that? We are producing coffee, we are serving the world, we are number four in the world, number three sometimes, but the producing regions are the poorest, one of the poorest. Among the poorest, um, this is, I just put, uh, it's, it's not in the book, but I told it because uh, yesterday, uh, the best we knew that, huh, of poverty. Look at that, all producing regions, like increasing poverty, increasing poverty. This is really interesting. Uh, the kids in Jakarta, Elapo is increasing, fortunately, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but the increasing, um, East Nusa Tenggara is always 22% poverty. Two hours, okay. This is really interesting. Uh, the challenge of the book is there. It's, uh, it's really straight um, contribute for the, uh, the basic rights of the people, okay? especially farmers. Right? This is uh, the, but maybe the book I, I don't have time to explore more. Maybe the book is not complete, I would say, because uh, it's very limited time. But uh, at least I'm trying to contribute to, 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 the, to the discussion. Um, I mentioned earlier there's a growing tendency of uh, Arabica. This side is Arabica, this side is Orusa, this is the latest news. The, the uh, um, price fluctuation is about the same. But in general, the price of Arabica is high. Okay? The red line is high. This is the, the, the left side is Magusta. Uh, so the tendency is specialty. Coffee specialty, or specialty coffee. And in Indonesia, we call it coffee specialty. This association has key association coffee specialty, or SKY, specialty coffee association of Indonesia. Um, this this uh, person or uh, the growing uh, urban style, lifestyle, everything, creating um, tendency of uh, farmers try to produce uh, specialty coffee. What are specialty coffee? This the one that's really um, unique, uh, have a tasty, and uh, more importantly, traceable, all the way to the to the producer. Okay, traceable. Of course, you do not want to. Um, drink coffee or to purchase coffee which are sources from national farms, for example, okay? You have to extend that. We exporting to, this, uh, to these countries, uh, mostly to European and to Japan. Uh, again, Arabica is growing to the United States, 46% of uh, we are exporting Arabica. Uh, normally, we are Rusta, because we are Rusta country. So, if you drink coffee, okay, the body of the coffee is Robusta, not from Elapo, okay? <laughs> uh, the body, if you drink coffee without Robusta, is not coffee. Figure it, it's chocolate or three in one. Uh, uh, it's not good coffee. <laughs> three in one is not good coffee. <laughs> not even coffee. I'm only a sugar. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, how was the trick? This is the trick. Okay. Um, I put a simplified or generalized, uh, there are some variations, but normally from farmers to collectors here, and some they are using farmers too, uh, all the way to exporters, domestic, international. Or from here to collectors, middlemen, or go to rosters, domestic rosters, uh, and international market, or from here to here, or put in the rural and urban area. Uh, there are a lot of uh, detailed studies of uh, the value uh, chain. Um, what I mean in here, um, there is a tendency. Uh, in my previous studies, uh, we don't put like this. If the coffee price is increasing, there is a tendency of those farmers to expand okay? the coffee land, sometimes even to the national party. Protection forest is always uh, in quotes, it's for the okay? But uh, in Indonesia, we could farm in protection forest. Yes, uh, this allow allowing uh, local people to farm in the protection forest as long as you adopt agroforestry system. But national park, no, big no. It's different. National park and protection forest, there are big differences. Okay. Um, 
then because of that concern, environmental concern, sustainability concern, in the global trade uh, area, um, there are growing, uh, we call it sustainability certification. They want to certify, but of course, the certification ideas come from the north, from the buyers. Okay? We are uh, producers trying to adopt, to adapt and adopt to that growing uh, tendencies. There are some names, so if you see, if you see the literature, uh, Global Environmental Governance, Global Certifying Partnership, Corporate Governance Initiative, whatever the name, it is the same certification. Okay? Uh, the, the arguments and the literature are different. Sometimes they're focusing on governance, sometimes they're focusing on uh, sustainability, sometimes it is good. Uh, this is part of a uh, global trade, okay? Uh, here, um, also growing, at least since 2002, I would say, the last 12 uh, years, okay? Um, farmers, some regions are trying to adopt, um, to really apply in certification. However, in the literature, the literature always says uh, they somehow restructure the supply chain of coffee, but uh, competing trend among certification parties, there are many certification, and resistance from state affiliated agencies competing the adoption of coffee certification. Why do you say resistance? Because a lot of uh, politics. Uh, Okay. At least there are one, two, three, four, five. If you see these logos, your coffee is going to be fine. This is called uh, first party. We call it first party because only Starbucks developed that. Actually, it's developed recently after tsunami, that is 2006. Um, cafe is coffee and farmers equity. The idea is to source, uh, to secure the supply of the coffee bean, okay? Uh, the second is not developed here, but the name is this, we call it Sustainable Agricultural Information. But here is developing information, mainly. Um, there is food certified, the logo like this, there's organic, it's like this. Um, this is also growing, uh, certified uh, Eric and Rainforest Alliance. And the last one, we call it four party, because uh, from the offer, um, the, the logo is like that. Uh, why we call it third party? Because it requires third party as uh, auditor. Auditor and auditor. This is the game of uh, coffee certification, which is growing uh, in the global trade, not only for coffee, for many commodities. I think you are aware about CPO, palm oil, um, they are doing this. Um, Cacao as well, and some uh, fishery products, tea, and everything. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about the, the three cases, the major production. Uh, Lampung, Robusta, those to, to Sud Arabica. Um, this is Pak Yusi. Uh, he is one of few coffee cuppers in this country, not many. I think uh, not even 10 persons who could do coffee cupping. Cupping, making testing. Uh, in, in, in coffee, we call it cupping, it's not testing. Um, I used to take a short course with, with, with him. I think I did pass. I, I did uh, five blind tests. I correct. I think I was like only two. Uh, I saw this lampung, uh, then uh, other, other thing I cannot differentiate. There are two, uh, 22 components of uh, coffee from here. Uh, bulky, baggy, shady, and everything. And he is one of, of the guy. Um, and today, it's really a growing uh, important job for barista. All barista have to practice and to do uh, coffee. It is growing in that day. That's the right thing. Ladies and gentlemen, um, coffee certifications uh, developing this is shared uh, system, okay? Under forest system. Sometimes we call it multi strata because there are some strata. Uh, the Sengon, uh, which is uh, Alicia, is kind of a room. If you put it here, if you plant here together with the coffee, uh, technically, sometimes you need less uh, chemical fertilizer because these trees have uh, modulating bacteria in the root, in the root system. Okay? Uh, and certified soil. Okay? 
Um, so the idea is which, which one comes first, whether agroforestry or the certificate. In fact, agroforestry comes first, okay? Um, because of the, the it's been practicing by our farmers that uh, uh, it's been taken, I could say, by certification time. Uh, in Toronto, it's less uh, I would say. Um, it's still uh, very traditional. Uh, here is uh, all national park in Baluku, we visited over there. Um, but the, the problem in here is um, government program intervention. Uh, I think you can imagine uh, sometimes the program from national government on credit with the programs from local and so on. The third one is Aceh. Aceh has been famous of value uh, profit. Uh, it's a um, lake uh, Danau Air Power okay, in uh, Akhenor. Um, this this uh, tenants I put it here. After the certification, farmers are not doing farming. 